Hey, I'm Carla Peruza, and now I am joined with a very special guest, legendary cut man, Jacob Stitch Duran. Stitch, how are you doing, man? Hey, man, I'm laying low. I'm on lockdown like you. <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of nice to, you know, and just kind of shoot the shit with somebody. Yeah, I hear that for sure. Um, just first question for you, in which ways did you get your involvement in combat sports first? How did you really get into it? Uh, well, you know, it, it all started in 1974. Uh, I was in the Air Force, and they stationed me in uh, in Thailand. And uh, I always, going into the military, if I went to the Orient Station in the Orient, I always wanted to study the martial arts, right? It was during the era of Bruce Lee and all that. So I got to Thailand and uh, on base. I saw my first Muay Thai fight. Uh, and on base, they had Taekwondo for the GIs. And so I started training there. And then uh, the Koreans left, and the Thais kind of took over the program for the uh, the the base and uh, the kind of transition us into the Muay Thai system and all that and that's how I got started crazy enough moved back to the Bay Area Oakland when I got out of the military and um, got into boxing to kind of improve my hands you know and just kind of started uh, working with amateur boxers training them and and uh, open up our school of kickboxing and moved to Vegas 26 years ago and here I am you know doing so I've done all assets from you know I've been able to trainer promoter and, had my own school of kickboxing and all that. So I uh, wanted to make the move to Vegas 26 years ago, and here I am. And now a lot of people know you as being a cut man. How did yeah. you get your start as a cut man? Well, through my school of kickboxing. You know, well, I, I take that back. When when I started, when when I got out of the military, I lived in Oakland, and, and I trained at King's Gym. As a matter of fact, I was his first member when they were opening up the gym. I kept driving by, and seeing when the gym was going to open so became their first uh member and i teamed up with a friend of mine that were like brothers now pete alvarado and um he uh introduced me into not only i was training in boxing but into training kids and i started working with amateurs with him and and uh then i moved to the suburbs in fairfield and opened up my own school of kickboxing but I was always in kickboxing. How did you learn to become a cut man? Where did you acquire the knowledge and the skills um, you have that make you one of the best in sport? You know, in, in, in those days, Carlo, there was no uh, there was no schools. Nobody wanted to teach. And I was learning to be a cut man because I was in kickboxing at that time. And I was working with Dennis Alexio that was the, at that time, like the light heavyweight, heavyweight chapter of the world in kickboxing, a badass dude. And, uh, but, you know, started working there, and then, uh, but I remember I went to a boxing event in Richmond, California. It was Marvin, Marvis Frazier, Joe Frazier's son, was fighting Bone Crusher Smith, and one of the earlier fights, the guy did a nice job on the guy's cut, and I went over there, and I told him, you know, I'm learning to be a cut man, if you could tell me what he did, and and uh, he literally says, you know, F you, he goes, I'm taking this to my grave, and you got to learn just like me, and he walked away. You know, that was the old mentality of boxing at that time is that they, everybody thought it was a secret what we do and, and that, uh, you know, you had to learn like them, you know, that type of stuff. And they were taking it to their grave. And so I felt like a piece of garbage, you know, and I told myself, I'm never going to be like this, man. You know, I was going to go out there and give back and, and teach. And that's what I've done, you know. So, and to this year, I've done, I mean, I've told that story hundreds of times and, I never threw the guy's name out, you know, and I know who he is now, you know, now in the game. Now I go back to the Bay area with Andre Ward and, uh, him and the son want to take a picture with me, you know? So he forgot, but I never did. And that just kind of encouraged me to, you know, go out there and, you know, teach guys how to take care of fighters. Wow. That's a crazy story. Um, back in the day, the MMA scene was nothing as it is today. Uh, there were a lot of horror stories about fighters first fights, especially in like amateur fights, really no weigh-ins, some had no rules, no blood work, no testing. It was kind of like a free-for-all. Do you have any wild stories of seeing any of these events like this back in the day? Uh, well, no, you know, I, I've been pretty fortunate. The ones that people I've worked with, uh, you know, just growing up and coming through the channels have always been uh, uh, straight up, you know. And uh, even me, when I promoted fights, you know, they were, you know, I, I did it with uh, one promotion I did it with. Uh, Solano College, you know, the baseball team, and and uh, we split the profits. And uh, the other two, I did them at uh, Travis Air Force Base because therefore Travis was, when I moved to the suburbs of Fairfield, I had school kickboxing there. 
in boxing I did in Oakland and kickboxing I did in Fairfield and and there I promoted with the military and the college so you know I, I always did the right thing but yeah th- those things definitely happen I know you know I I've seen videos and all that and uh but you know times have changed and now what do you think made the sport grow and evolve so much from at one point you know people kind of calling it human cockfighting if you will and now it's an everyday sport every year more and more people are doing it and it's one of the biggest sports in the world you know i i gotta give top credit to literally lorenzo and frank Fortita, you know and then bringing dana into the ufc and uh because i quit watching the original ufc it just you know me being a martial artist it just it was too brutal for me because the only rules were there were no rules, and uh, for the most part, right? I mean, you could crack guys in the nuts and headbutt them and all that, and so I quit watching it. But Lorenzo and Frank, when Dana asked me to come on board, he said that they had implemented something like 34 different rules, and that got my, you know, my interest, and and that's really what started making this game so much better. And and in all fairness. Uh, with them bringing in Cupman, I thought it was ingenious. You know, for him to, for Dana, Dana's the one that brought me in, for him to have the foresight to, you know, let's have a Cupman on each side of the corner because MMA uh, is such a new sport that these guys don't know how to take their fighters. And, you know, at that time, Leon Tabs and myself were boxing guys. And Dana brought us in for that. And I thought that was really the whole start of everything. Got to give him credit for that. Because uh, they're the ones that uh, put MMA on the map. So now, did Dana literally just call you up one day and said, "I want you to be one of my cut guys"? Is that how that went down? Yeah, yeah, literally. It's uh, you know, I always see Dana in the gyms, and uh, it was funny because they were never friends, right? And uh, but you know, we were all in the gyms. But I always, you know, say, and people we all say is, you know, Dana says he was in boxing, and yeah, sure he was. He was in the gym with us, you know. But uh, we were training fighters, and he was doing pad work for a lot of the executives and their wives and all that and you know he was never really a, a boxing guy you know in vegas maybe in in boston but never here in vegas and but nonetheless he's the one that brought me in and i was doing a k1 at uh bellagio and i think mike tyson was there and i think uh you know so i was working the fights and dana hit me up and asked me for my card and the next day he called and says hey man we bought the ufc and you know, we want to see if, you know, you want to be a cut man along with Leon Taz. And I didn't know who Leon Taz was at that time. Uh, but he was the original cut man from UFC number one. And, uh, you know, with the new roles that we talked about, that, yeah, of course, you know, gave me a great opportunity to do what I do. So uh, that's how I came on board. Now, before every single fight, um, for a long period of time, I'm sure you even still do it at some events now, um, you're in the back with the fighters, you're wrapping their hands before they go out and compete. Can you talk about the different types of wraps? For example, what is different between the knockout wrap and a submission wrap? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. And, you know, I kind of, uh, uh, everything, you know, you got to understand, Carlos, that fighters are the baddest dudes in the world, men and women, you know, just to get in there and, and crack each other in the face and the head and, and, and still be friends. It's, it's, it's insane. Uh, but, you know, for these guys to go out there and do what they do and then and then be the nicest people in the world, that, that's what makes it interesting, you know. So that's a tough question. That's a good question. But when you're wrapping up hands, is it different from MMA to boxing? Is the same thing like the same, the actual um, thing about of rock, the actual thing of wrapping up hands itself? Is it the same concept? Yeah, it is. It's, it's the same technique because I always say that if it works for boxers that, you know, their whole – the only weapons are the left and the right, you know, so they use their hands more than MMA guys. So if it works for boxing, it works for MMA, you know. And uh, But, you know, you're talking about the knockout rap or the tap-out rap. I, I kind of came out with that just to give the guys the confidence, you know. And and, and for the most part, yeah, the, 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 the tap-out rap will give you a little bit more flexibility, but you'll still be able to close your hand and, and crack somebody and, and, and do some damage. You know, some guys, uh, they want the knockout wrap, which is just to just locks everything in, you know. So uh, all the metacarpals and the wrist and the thumb and all that, and just kind of makes it a little bit more tighter and a little bit more secure. So that that was the difference. But it's uh, you know, you can knock either one out with trust me with the tap out wrap. Your your knockout ratio could be as as, as good as the tap out uh, uh, or the the knockout wrap. But 
you know, it's it's all psychological. It's all how you hit and when you hit. And, and bottom line, when you wrap the hands so they don't break them. You know, if I'm going to knock you out, I'm going to knock you out. How are you assigned a certain fighter? Uh, did fighters ever request you, or did the promotions just say, Stitch, you got these 10 guys? How did that all work? Yeah, well, you know, and, and, and basically we – that's why I got to give a lot of credit to Leon Tabs. You know, he was the original cut man from UFC number one and they brought him on board and he was the old school cut man from Philadelphia. Uh, got to give him a lot of credit cause he, you know, we set up this program that everybody uses now, but, uh, for the most part is I would be on one side of the corner uh, of the ring and, and Leon would be on the other and whoever the UFC, however they set up their schedule, uh, we would work with them, you know, but then it got to the point where later on I started uh, working with the house fighters for the most part. And uh, But, yeah, requests, man, I used to get guys, <laughs> coaches that used to call me at home and ask me if, if, I, could, if, if I could wrap their fighters' hands, you know, and, and definitely work the corner. And, you know, I tell them, you know, work, wrapping your hands, yeah, of course, you know, I'd be glad to. But working the corner, you got to talk to Dana, you know, because whoever they, wherever they put me is up to them. You know, and, and they understood that. So, but yeah, shoot, I'd, I'd get called special requests all the time. They still do. You know, if I do MMA shows, guys want me to wrap their hands. But, and it's that confidence builder and, and you know, but I wrap a good hand. So, yeah, that's kind of the stuff I, get, I do every weekend. When you're in the back before a fight, can you tell based on how a fighter's going to act if they're going to win or lose? Could you, is there been a moment before when you're like, you know, this guy's really nervous. I don't care if he's going to win. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, it, I'm not going to say all of them, but there's there's guys you could definitely read, you know, because you have the A-side corner and the B-side corner. That happens all the time. And it, a lot of times I've been in the A-side corner and a lot of times I've been in the B-side corner. So you can see some of the body language and, and, and you look at one fighter and you compare him to the guy that he's fighting and just, you know, body language and and. and the physicality and all that, uh, you look at it and then you kind of make a determination. But, nah, you know, it's, in this game, all it takes is one shot. But, yeah, if you were going to bet one way or the other, you kind of look and say, oh, shit, he's in trouble, you know. <laughs> so, of course, you know, you can see that. Have you noticed any particular fighter to be more nervous or more calm than others? Are there any guys who stuck out, like whenever you drop their hand, they're like, they're not nervous at all. They're calm or like this guy's just really shaking. He just gets nervous. Oh man. I've had guys that when I'm wrapping their hands, they, they start crying. You know, I have guys, their palms are all sweaty and, and you know, I've had guys that joking around with me and we're telling stories and, and laughing and all that stuff. So yeah, of course, you know, I come through all the, and that's the thing about, that's what makes my job so interesting is that I go through, I see all these personalities and, and I look at these guys as, as gladiators that are sitting right in front of me and I'm wrapping their hands. I'm getting ready for battle. And, you know, some guys cry and some guys, you know, there's, you know, are nervous as shit and some guys are happy and some guys are ready to go to war. And that's, you know, those are the patterns that I see. So it's, it's tough to say, you know, this or that, but yeah, you know, it's, uh, I see it all. So that's, that's kind of awesome. It's been told that a guy like George St. Pierre before a fight is an absolute nervous wreck. Have you ever wrapped GSP's hands? And uh, could you attest to that at all? No, you know what? No, I've wrapped GSP's hands many times. And every time I wrapped his hands, uh, he was cool. But, you know, one of the things that I do, Carlo, is when I work with these guys, when I sit down with them, I, I treat them like they're my children, you know, and, and I let them know that. And because, you know, they know that I'm going to cover their back. But, uh when they sit down in front of me and I start wrapping their hands, I'll shoot the shit with them and uh, relax them, you know, and, and just kind of take them out of that. And I think Vitor Belfort said that at best in an interview. He says, when I see Stitch walking into the dressing room, knowing that he's working on the other side, he brings that calming effect. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the things that I give these guys. And, you know, that's one of the things that uh, you just can't give it to them. It's, they have to understand that it comes from my heart uh, and, and they know I'm going to, you know, cover their backs all the way. So it's, yeah, it's a trip, man, just to work with these guys. During a fight now, what are you watching? What are you, what are you doing when one your guy is there? Are you just focusing on his face, focusing on the cut? What are you making mental notes of during the actual fight itself? Damn, Carl, you're pretty good, man. <laughs> There's been a lot of interviews and, 
uh, the questions you're asking are top of the line questions, man, that a lot of people don't ask all the time. But, uh, yeah, that's a good question. This one here is, you know, my whole focus is their face. And, and I'll tell when I come in with a new team, like when I was with Tyson Fury, you know, I met them. I just told the guys, you know, the coaches, I said, look, man, just give me a space and you guys take everything else, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but my whole thing is, 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 you know, is the face. Yeah. I look at the kind of damage they're, they're receiving, you know, if it's an MMA fight and, you know, there's a ground and pound and all that. I mean, literally every fight I prepare for the worst case scenario. So I have everything ready for for one cut. Then, But I also have stuff available, easy access, if I need it for the second cut. You see what I'm saying? So if I have to go in, in, in when the bell rings for one cut, I have that stuff. Uh, but if there's two cuts, then easily I could just pick up the other uh, applications that I need for to work on two cuts instead of one. So, yeah, I got it down now. You mentioned Tyson Fury. Um, for you, uh, was it kind of like a really happy thing for you to see a guy, you know, he struggled with so much, he goes out and after what he just did to Deontay Wilder, for you, was that kind of like a good moment in your heart there? Yeah, you know, a lot of great moments, man. I mean, tremendous, tremendous moments that I've had throughout my career, and you know, with Fedor Emelianco, you know, working with the Klitschko brothers, just so many stories worldwide. But this one kind of... <laughs> falls in a real special category because, uh, number one, the Tyson Fury fight with Deontay Wilder, the rematch based on what happened last time and based on what happened on Tyson Fury's last fight when he got cut, all led up to a lot of drama heading into this fight. And the big, one of the big dramas was the cut that he got before. And for them to bring me in, for Tyson Fury to request me and Bob Arum to request me, uh, to work with them uh, for me was was a big honor because it elevated the importance of cut men. Not only me, but the importance of cut men for every fighter. Every fighter should have a good cut man because uh, we do make a difference and we have made money for a lot of fighters. And this happened to be one of those cases where Bob Barrow and you know said, "No, nah, let's bring him in." So I met him and and uh, super super guy. But I I literally took that what you and I talked about earlier, that pressure off of his mind, where I told him, you know, don't worry about it. I'm going to, you know, do preventive maintenance on your on your cut every round. I'm just going to make sure nothing happens to it and keep the inflammation down and what have you not. And I told him, I'm going to take care of you like you're my son. So that's a good point right there. Now, what are some ways, you just mentioned uh, doing maintenance on the cuts. What are some ways of doing maintenance? Are you applying like Vaseline? Is it different types of pressures? Like, I mean, I don't want you, you to tell us all your secrets, but what are some ways <laughs> you to prevent like cuts from getting really bad? Yeah, I remember, man, there are no secrets. They're all, they're all technique. <laughs> so, but no, it's something like that. You know, when, when like, let's talk about Tyson Fury because he got that real bad cut to fight before and, and Jorge Capetillo, the, the cutman I worked on, well, he's a friend of mine. He's a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, he, he went through the deep depths of, of something that cutmen don't work on all the time. And, uh, you know, he did enough for Tyson Fury to win the fight. So that brings a lot of drama. And I literally just took that away. But what I do is I, I told him, I'm going to keep ice or the chaos well on your, on your cut every round and just keep cold, direct pressure on it so that it doesn't inflame or anything like that. And, and I minimize the chances of it getting cut uh, just by, you know, keeping it uh, uh, nice and cold. So, yeah, so that's one of the things. And just, you know, the Vaseline is always applied only because, in theory, the Vaseline is designed so that the punches slide off of the cut a lot easier. And But I've always said, with that being said, it's probably true to a point, but, a lot of fighters get a lot of cuts that have Vaseline on them, you know, so, so uh, I don't know. It's a good theory. You've worked thousands and thousands of fights. Are you proud of a certain uh, fighter that you've saved? Was the cut really, really bad? And you're like, you know what? I kept him in the fight. I'm proud of this moment. Oh, yeah. There's been there's been tons of moments like that, man. And, you know, these guys appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I, for me, of course, it's it's historical, you know, to make a big difference you know, in a guy's fight, not only in just, you know, working the, you know, stopping the cuts and, and, and have them continue and have them win, but it's just, you know, keeping them safe throughout the whole thing, you know, and, and, uh, like Ra Raul Marcus, that was my coming out party was Raul Marcus. He was the, uh, super middleweight champion IBF from Houston, Texas. And, uh, he defended his title 
uh, against Keith Mullins when Oscar De La Hoya fought, I think, Hector Camacho is here at the Thomas and Mac. And this was my coming out party in Vegas, actually in boxing, because people knew me through kickboxing, and uh, but not so much in boxing, right? While well, Raul Marcus ended up with five big cuts, two on each eyebrow and two below the, on the cheeks and one on the nose and, you know, and, I mean, a shitload of just gashes, and I kept him in the game, and he defended his title, and that was, you know, people thought, you know, who is this guy? You know, but that was that was my coming out party. Yeah, he had like 70, 70 stitches all together. Were you fortunate enough to work uh, the Griffin, the first Griffin Bonner fight? Yeah, of course. I uh, I was with. I told you, I got a shitload of stories, man. <laughs> I got stories like nobody. But I uh, uh, I worked um, uh, for his Griffin's corner, and uh, and you know during the reality shows and everything, you know I always rap for his hands. In fact, I always rap Stefan's hands also. But on this one, I worked with Forrest, and at the end of the fight, uh, one of his coaches says, we're standing there before the decision is being made. He's a stitch. He goes, I'm not gay, but i got to give you a kiss, man, because you did a great job on Forrest. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, so you got to give me a little hug, a little kiss on the cheek right there on the ring. So that was one of those nice, nice moments. And then, uh, so, yeah, I was there. When you were watching that fight, um, could you kind of tell that that fight could potentially change the whole UFC and put it into a whole new dimension? You know, at that time, I didn't even know. I didn't look at it that way. I just looked at it, what a fight. Because normally under, you know, any circumstances, my job is to keep my composure, right? Uh, man, on this one, I was jumping up like a kid, you know? <laughs> like a fan. So it was it was a good fight, man. And bless, you know, both Stefan and, and Forrest for doing the job that they did. And now last question for you, Stitch. Uh, do you feel that combat sports will have a place in your life in one way or another forever? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's, I'm pretty much locked and loaded into it already. You know, people stop me in the streets and, hey, man, they, they say, okay, you're the UFC guy, right? And, uh, you know, I quit saying that. I'm not with them anymore. I just say, yeah, that's me. You know, because <laughs> they still see me on TV on a lot of the, a lot of the reruns, you know. And uh, But I'm I'm the UFC guy or, or the Creed guy. Hey, you came out in Creed, huh? You know, so... Uh, uh, and that now it's, uh, uh, hey, hey, man, you work with Tyson Fury. That's the new one, right? So yeah, those are the kind of uh, yeah events I've been in. So I'm kind of lucky to be where I'm at. All right, Stitch. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you giving me the time to sit down and talk to me today. Thank you so much, sir. All right, my man. Good job. Keep it up, huh?